Amen. Y'all don't mind if I get comfortable, do you? So um, I want to give you um, a bit of code. In Texas, there is you all or y'all. And then when I mean the whole group, it's all y'all. So when I say all y'all, it's everybody. When I say you all, then it's a table. Um, <clears throat> Anita, thank you very much. I'm going to get comfortable because I just love to roam around on stage. And I've got to talk with my hands and my legs and everything else. Uh, the lights are really bright. I was told that the light was much better over here. And so I'm going to ask that table to come up and sit here. And then I'm just going to present from over on that side. <clears throat> so thank you, Anita, and thank you, ASQ. You guys are, are, are very special to me. Thank you for, for asking me to come back this year. Uh, it's an honor to be here. Um, there are so many fine people that I've had the privilege of working with. Deborah Hebison, I drug Deborah along with me this year. Deborah, can you stand up? <clears throat> There's Deborah. <clears throat> when, when I tell you last year, I think we talked a little bit about the fact that quality is the heart and soul of any project, and uh, Deborah is the heart and soul of, of our projects, and uh, she's just a great friend. Deborah and I have had the privilege of working together for a long time. There's another, uh, of course, Anita. Uh, Anita, if, and if you, I'm going to call out a few of these folks. If you haven't had a chance to talk with them, please talk with them, share with them. These are really exceptional people. Anita Lidbury, most of you know Anita. Um, it's really kind of nice when Anita doesn't have much of a voice because it's fun to pick on her. And just watch her, you know, kind of, she wants to get back at me, but she doesn't have much voice, so, uh, but, but um, we, we love you, Anita, and thank you for your passion. There's Chuck Canapicky here in the audience today. Where's Chuck? There he is. If you don't know Chuck, uh, know Chuck. Uh, a little bit ago, in the, out, as we were standing out front and we were talking, uh, somebody who knows Chuck said, well, you know, he's just a bridge guy. Well, I got to tell you, quality is about building bridges for projects. Quality is building bridges to get things done, and uh, there are none finer than Chuck Canapicky. So if you don't know Chuck, get to know Chuck. I also um, I want to uh, give a shout out to Freddie Bastillo. Freddie and I worked together a long time ago. Freddie, yeah, <clears throat> and Freddie is um, he's one of these he's one of these guys that. Um, as he looks to serve a client, there's quality in everything that he does, and it may not be construction quality focused, but it's quality in everything he does. And so get to know Freddie. There's so many folks here today, and so uh, I wanted to tell you a little bit about my impressions from yesterday. I had a bit of a challenging day yesterday. I drove 300 miles. I sit on the Texas College Board of Trustees, and so I went to do my duty at Texas College yesterday, and we were trying to build new dormitories, and so that's really one of the things that I love to do is build and design and construct, plan. And so I got to do that. I was in Tyler, Texas, and then I came back to Dallas and then hopped on a flight and came into Tucson. And so when I got here last night, just an absolute beautiful evening, I had been working on about a 16-hour day already, and I thought, oh, I just don't know if I've got the energy to go find the lost village or what, the, the lost something. What was it? Territory. There you go, lost territory. Yes, that's it. Um, and, and so Deborah, and, and this is true to Deborah, uh, Deborah grabbed my left arm and twisted it, and then she had my right arm. She goes, no, we're going. I don't care if you're tired. And, and so we went down there, and when I got there, it was this absolutely beautiful place. The, the sky was clear, and the half moon was out. People were dancing and having fun. I don't know about y'all, all, all y'all, but the barbecue was really good. And, um, and, you know, and I thought, ASQ Audit Division. Now, I'm a colorblind engineer. And, you know, to a lot of folks, we're just not all that exciting. But I got to tell you, y'all know how to throw a good party. That was fun last night. And uh, so thank you for doing that. <clears throat> I also understood that um, they have this, 
the special activity down there in the Lost Territory, and it's called Rattlesnake Watch or Snake Watch. And uh, you know, I thought I tasted a little something different in the potato salad last night, but uh, I wasn't sure. So let's talk a little bit about uh, Tucson. When, why would you have uh, the American Society for Quality annual conference in Tucson, Arizona? What could they possibly have in common? Well, I did a little research, since this is technology, is the focus for, for this topic. I did a little research, and I found a lot of cool things. Um, outdoor activities. Do you realize, because of the elevations, Tucson is set in, in a desert? That seemed kind of intuitive to me. But it's the Sonora Desert. And it's not the Mojave, like out in, in um, Las Vegas. And, and it's just beautiful. And the, and the life, the elevations, elevation ranges from about 2,400 feet up to almost 10,000 feet. And this valley is surrounded by five mountain ranges. And if you know much about the, the nine world life zones, encompassed between this area is seven out of those nine world life zones. And, you know, there's things like hiking and biking and running. Well, okay, forget running, rewind. Hiking and biking and, and those types of things that it's a beautiful outdoor place. And when the sun goes down while it was a bit chilly last night, it's just absolutely beautiful. Somebody told me the other day, well, yeah, but it's hot in the summer. Geez, people, I lived in Texas for 20 years. I mean, it's hot everywhere in the summer. And I know, Tim, it's really hot here. The asphalt gets sticky. And so I was talking to one of the local guys last night, and I said, is it true, really? The asphalt gets sticky? I mean, do you ever have anybody just stuck where they can't move? Well, no, but I'll tell you this. I carry an extra pair of shoes in my car during the summer just in case. Um, so you adapt, right? Uh, the sunsets are absolutely beautiful. We flew in last night, coming in over the mountain ranges. You're kind of, you know, it looks like a video game, and I'm watching the pilot. He's navigating and twisting and turning and swishing around. And the sun was setting. It was just absolutely beautiful. I said, wow, this is the first time I've been to Tucson, Arizona, and I haven't even touched the ground, and I love it already. It was just magnificent. You ha we've got the University of Arizona, the Wildcats. Uh, any, any Wildcat grads out there? All right, there you go. That's what I'm talking about. Nice. <clears throat> There's a geology uh, and a gem show. Uh, anybody out there have any particular interest in girls' best friend, diamonds, you know, other types of precious gems? So listen, guys, Christmas is just around the corner. Take home that Christmas present to your, to your loved one. Uh, go and do a little shopping while you're here. That was not a paid advertisement. World-class golf. World-class golf. I'm telling you, this is... This is the place to golf if you're, if you're into golfing. And I dig up more dirt and sod than anything, but I think they'd even let me play here. So if you get a chance to do that, do that. The other thing is I, I found this reference to a famous Dave's. Anybody know what famous Dave's is? Yeah, they, they have, um, it's famous Dave's barbecue, and they have this thing called burnt ends. I thought that was something that got left out in the sun too long. Um, but these little nuggets, I mean, it's just really cool how they tie all this together. Uh, the other thing that I thought was, was funny was is that in Austin, Texas, we have the bats that come out, and they have a lot of bats here, you know, in the area. And so if you've never seen a swarm of bats come out in the evening and go out and eat bugs, I, I didn't get bit by a mosquito. I didn't worry about West Nile virus at all last night. There were no bugs, you know. I think we need to import some of those bats into Dallas because um, we're having a huge problem with West Nile virus. There's a big art influence here. And there is, um, anybody like magic? I mean, you know, when I was a kid, I used to do all these, you know, quirky tricks, you know, flip the quarters on your fingers and, you know, pick out the cards and all that. They, they have a, uh, it's called the Carnival of Illusions, and apparently this is a really cool thing. So if you're looking for a great thing to do, you know, this is the place to do great things. It's a place to do unusual things. And you're saying, well, geez, McKay, I get all that, but what does that have to do with quality? It's a quality of life. It's a quality of life. And while today we're going to talk about our work life, I'm going to suggest to you that there's a work-life balance. And when you love what you do, it's easy to get immersed in it. It's easy to go for 16 hours a day or 18 hours a day. It's easy to go, well, not easy, to go and travel a lot 
And, but you got to keep that work-life balance. So as I was thinking about that last night, I, I found Arizona Brittle. Has everybody ever had Arizona Brittle? Oh, my God. I mean, listen, here's the ingredients. Sugar, pecans, butter. I mean, you had me at, at those three, right? Yeah. I mean, those are three of the major food groups right there. And so you think, it's got to be good for you. But then cayenne chili pepper, dried rosemary, chili flakes, lemon juice. And about that point, I'm thinking, I don't know if I'm going to try this. It was absolutely fantastic. So if you haven't tried the Arizona Brilli, you got to try that. Um, and then the other thing that I thought was interesting with all of the talk about how hot it is and do activities in, in the cool time of the evening or the cool time of the morning, this is the first place I've ever been and stayed. We're, you know, on, on the bathroom shelf where they have shampoo and they have shower caps and things like that. You know what else they had? Did you notice this? They had a little tube of the green gel, after sun cooling and bombing gel. And I thought, it, it, yeah, I guess it does get hot. I'm going to stay in today so I don't go back with a sunburn. So those are some of the cool things that I found out about, about uh, Tucson, Arizona. And, you know, I, and I got all of that through technology, through just a bit of surfing on the Internet. And, um, and so it's a great thing. It's a great thing, and we need that. We can use that. We can leverage that. So today I want to talk to you a little bit about technology and its effects on quality. And uh, just as a note, uh, Anita, I think this is my countdown timer here. I've got three hours and 45 minutes left. Is that right? Perfect. Um, <clears throat> so one of the things that I wanted to do is I wanted to just go through, I'm going to give you a little perspective on DART because the, the, the experience that I'm going to talk to you about is based upon our experiences and our program. And so I'm just going to cue up a little bit about DART. We're a, we're a public transit system. We're a, a pseudo state government entity. We have 13 member cities that contribute a one cent sales tax, which funds all of our operations, our expansion, you know, everything that we do. We, uh, we have a bus system, a light rail system. Uh, who would have thought that in Dallas, Texas, we have the longest light rail system in the country? We operate about 87 miles. And the last 12 years, 13 years, we, we have doubled the system. We started with um, 13 years ago when I took my position. We had 42 miles of double track light rail and now we have about 87 and we have a bit more building to do. We're expanding in the commuter rail market, uh, high occupancy vehicle, uh, paratransit obviously and then van pool and streetcar is on the way and so these are the modes that, that we get to work with, these are the modes that, that I get to work with and, and, and I'm going to give you a bit of that flavor only because I think it, it helps you understand maybe one of the main messages that I want to talk about today, and that is, is that not, there's not a one-size-fits-all for any of this. Technology defined, and I want to read this, and I hope it makes more sense to you than it did to me. The branch of knowledge that deals with the creation and use of technical means and their interrelation with life, society, and the environment drawing upon such objects as industrial arts, engineering, applied science, and pure science. I got to the branch of knowledge, and then it started to get fuzzy. What does that mean? I mean, this, you know what this looked like to me? When I read this the first time, I thought, isn't this kind of the way we sometimes write specifications? We write specifications to achieve an objective, and so we use terms like that deals with creation and use of technical means and their interrelationship with life and society and the environment. And, and so I thought this was really odd, and as I started thinking about it, I thought, well, okay, what are the things about technology, life with technology? And I chose this picture because, I don't know, for those of you that have kids or grandkids or no kids, it's almost like they're born with this innate ability to program TVs, to operate computers, to do things like that. And so life with technology, there's advantages. It should be more convenient. It was really convenient for me to just get out my tablet and to do a search about Tucson. 
It was pretty easy, even for the colorblind engineer. It was entertaining. Some of the things that you find are entertaining. You can, I, I didn't know this, but guys, did you know you can watch football games on these tablets and things like that? I mean, seriously, that is great. Um, it's real time, and I'm gonna talk about real time and how that applies. And it's, the, but the thing, in, and it's an advantage, but it's also a huge disadvantage. It is constantly changing and evolving. Now, that's a good thing, but sometimes it's really frustrating. And so the disadvantages, lazy. You know, instead of my daughter getting out and playing games, she sits down with her tablet and she plays games. I'm like, baby, you gotta get out and get some exercise, you know? This is, yeah, I know, daddy, but it's hot out there, you know? I can play games right here. I can talk with my friends right here. Whatever happened to play dates, whatever happened to a group of kids getting together and going to the baseball park or whatever. And those are the things that concern me a little bit about technology. The lack of communication or skills. You know, it's easier, it's easier to sit down and send an email sometimes than it is to go and sit down in somebody's office and work out an issue. Have you guys ever had that challenge? Sometimes I get copied, and you can copy the world on emails, right? So that's a good thing. And now you've just brought the world into something that's an issue about this big, and now everybody is spending time dealing with it. So emails are kind of odd. Does anybody write letters anymore? Or, you know, I guess maybe email is the communication. There's, um, there's Skyping. There's uh, something that I learned about the other day from my APTA kids. My APTA kids are a group of, of young adults in the American Public Transportation Association. It's called the Early Career Program. And my APTA kids are generally in their mid to late 20s and technology, and they teach me this stuff, and I'm just like, wow, seriously, you could do that? I mean, I've got my PDF. I didn't know I could do that. I thought it was just text and phone calls, and, and so they, they teach me about those types of things, but sometimes the way they communicate, it takes away interpersonal skills, and so those are the things that I think we have to be paying particular attention to. I put cost on here because one of the frustrating things is, is, is that you can get locked into a, an enterprise system and then you're stuck. And it's very, very hard to change. It's very, very hard, and sometimes once you get hooked, now it's pretty expensive to do the maintenance. It's pretty expensive to do the updates. It's pretty expensive to do those things. So it can be very costly. Uh, constantly evolving and changing, we talked about that. That's an advantage, and that's a disadvantage. So life with technology, ever feel like you're the guy hanging on the cliff there? Don't worry, technology will save you. And, and I have to tell you, uh, I chose that particular graphic only because I do believe that a lot of times when I was, I was talking with Chuck earlier today and his project is a, a little project, three and a half billion dollars, and with all of the funding partners and with all of the, the uh, requirements, uh, you know, if you don't leverage technology, you just physically can't have enough bodies to keep up. And so it's interesting that sometimes I feel like I'm hanging on and technology saves me, and sometimes I feel like I'm right out on the edge and technology is about to push me over. And this was me, they just made it a cartoon, the other one. Uh, I get frustrated with my computer. Generally, I don't bash it like that, I just push it down the stairs because, you know, I don't know, there's something frustrating about it sometimes. I can't get it to do what I want it to do. And so, um, you know, now this looks like Beavis and Butthead for some of you that may, you know, have seen Beavis and Butthead. Some of you are probably too, uh, too young for that. But it's really not. And, and I wanted to talk about the four generations, and we're embarking on a fifth generation in the workplace. These are the traditionalists, what I call the JFKs. It is really the group that says, ask not what my country can do for me, but what I can do for my country. Uh, it is a very... Um, uh, interesting. Most of our parents um, were part of this generation. Uh, most of them had some association with the Depression. They've, they've had some association with some interesting times in the country's history. And then there's the baby boomers. Most of us probably fall into the baby, baby boomer category. Uh, we, are, we are probably uh, the reason why the um, uh, retirement program, you know, for the country uh, Social Security is going to go bankrupt because we're all going to go and, and retire and, 
and uh, draw down on that system. There's the Gen X group, and you know the, the baby boomers I liken to workaholics, right? Anybody resemble that out there? Yeah. Um, then there's the Gen X uh, group. The, these are um, interesting from a standpoint of how they relate in the workplace, and, and the focus is technology. You know, keep in mind the traditionalist group or the JFKs, they, they came around in a period of time when we didn't have the cell phones, we didn't have the PDAs, we didn't have those types of things, uh, didn't have fax machines, you know, didn't have desktop computers. Uh, even in the baby boomers early in my career, we would do geotechnical reports, a 35 or 40 page report, and it would all be typed and cut and paste and, you know, and it was just, it was crazy. Um, it was just crazy how we used to produce reports like that. And, and I was, I, I just can't tell you how excited I was to get a word processor so that you didn't have to do all of that. And so we'd cut and paste this document and it looked like a Frankenstein of sorts. And then we would copy it on letterhead and when you copied it with a decent copier, it actually looked pretty good. And I was like, wow, that's like smoke and mirrors kind of stuff. It's, it's almost like producing television. Um, so back to the Gen Xers. The, the Gen Xers are a, are a, a group of folks. They're very bright. Um, they are very, they have a, um, a mentality of, okay, I'm gonna do this for a couple years and then I'm in charge. You know, um, they're, they're somewhat technology driven, although not as much as the, as the millennials. One of the things about the Gen Xers is the feedback. You know, they are stuck on this immediate feedback. There's none of this, well, let me think about that and I'll get back to you. It is, listen, there's no reason why we have to do that. We have technology, we can do this. I, I wanna know now. And, uh, and then the Millennium Group, these are, um, the, and this is our future, by the way. Uh, these, are, these are great generations and they're all a little bit different. The Millennium Group is, they grew up with computers you know, their entire life and so it is not a foreign thing to them and they, they don't have the perspective that some of us have had. And I bring this up only because here the cartoon says, no, the defibrillators are not available in an iPhone app yet. Um, but that's kind of typical, and, and so as I sat down and started to look at how do you infuse technology in quality? And, and so here's DART as an agency. These are some of the big things that we've done. Um, as an agency, voice over internet protocol, we, we've, we've made a transition there. These are seemingly pretty easy, but they're different. Uh, down in the bottom, we, we went from group-wise to Google, and so that's our CIO uh, in a spacesuit. The only thing I would tell you about that is I'm really glad they didn't choose a Superman theme. I think the whole tights thing would have been just too much. Um, but these are big programs, and, and so as you're looking at how to implement these, you have a lot of different needs. Uh, in growth and regional development, we have a, a sphere where we have and I went through the different modes. There's, there's the innovation and transit-oriented development component. There's a component for planning and development. There's a commuter rail component. There's a rail program component, and then there's rail planning. And when you think about those, and you think about infusing technology into the group, these are very diverse groups. They're driven by very different things, and they're driven by very different regulatory agencies. And so, in growth and regional development, I've, I've kind of put these in three categories. There's the elective category. These are things that we choose to do. We want to be more efficient. We want to be able to connect with other people. And so we choose to do these things. Um, it could be that we choose to do it because it is um, more sustainable, less cost effective, those are all driving reasons uh, that we choose to do that. And then there's things that are conditional. Uh, any of you have gotten any federal funds uh, here lately? Well, maybe a couple years ago, because I don't think there is any federal funds here lately. Uh, but if you, if you get grants or you get those types of, um, of dollars, a lot of times there's conditions that are attached to that, right? And sometimes those conditions have to do with a type of reporting, a format for reporting, those types of things. And so when they're conditional, uh, maybe you do a joint venture or you do a certain type of a project delivery and now, now they, are, they, are, um, uh, they have barbs or they have conditions that come with them. And then there's mandated. Uh, there's several of these. Probably one of the biggest ones in the commuter rail world has to do with positive train control. Most everybody's familiar with positive train control, right? 
Um, much like the airline industry, this is a collision avoidance system for trains. And if you've been paying attention, we've, we've had a few train accidents here lately. Matter of fact, uh, when we were in Chicago a week ago, there was a runaway train that got out of the yard and got onto the main line and collided. Uh, fortunately, there were, in, there were only injuries, there weren't any deaths. Uh, but, but these are the types of mandated things uh, with positive train control that, that takes, you attempt to take the human element out. Is that a good thing? I wonder. Sometimes the most powerful computer we can use is right here, is the brain. And, and as we're implementing technology and we are making things more convenient and easier, as we are looking for ways to automate the basics of what we do, I think we have to be careful that we don't totally disengage the brain. Part of some of the challenges that I see on construction projects, uh, survey. Survey has been a particularly challenging issue for a lot of construction contractors over the last couple of years. And part of it is because there's a new generation of folks and they have this technology and now you have uh, equipment and, and it's synced up to computer systems and so they have these guides and these gauges for grading and, and profiling. You punch all of that into the computer and all of a sudden you get, you get something out that, that it does everything except for probably turn on and turn off a, a piece of uh, earth moving equipment, a, a motor grader or something like that. The issue with that is, is that as you're putting things in, if we don't really understand how the program works and how the limitations are, or if we don't have the experience to understand the output, sometimes we can get astray. And so we've had a few problems, and these are not just on our projects, but it's been systemic across the country for some of these construction companies, and that is, is that they take this equipment, they purchase it, and they think that they can mitigate their risk, and then they put it in the hands of, of young professionals who don't have that seasoning and that experience, and so when they dump data in and they get data out, it may not always jump off the page as to there's an issue here, there's a potential issue. The, uh, some of the things that, that I want to share with you today, there's, there's records management. I mean, how horrible is that? I know this is the audit division of uh, American Society of Quality, but how horrible is it sometimes just dealing with the volume of documents? You know, we're trying to move into electronic documents. I know our attorneys are telling us, well, yeah, but you still need to have the signed copies and the ink copies. We're having a hard time, you know, getting past that. Um, and so we end up scanning, you know, we do things the old-fashioned way, and we have signatures on everything, and then we turn around and scan it and put it into electronic records management. And so those are some of the things that we, that we, um, struggle with. Now on the, on the other side, from a standpoint of distribution and file sharing, those types of things, it's pretty convenient. It's pretty convenient to be able to just share documents and people can work on documents at the same time and you can see their comments and you can see their input and so it's very collaborative. Real estate uh, is another one that we've moved into. We, we own 200 and, it's about 260 miles of rail corridor in North Texas right now. And as you can imagine, uh, we we made purchases back in the early 80s. And whenever you purchase something like that, a rail corridor, you get a lot of stuff that comes with it. And that's about the politest term I could think of today in mixed company, stuff that comes with it. And, and so there's a lot of, there's a lot of um, crossings, there's a lot of uh, existing license agreements and those types of things. And right now, uh, my commuter rail group, there, there's four people in that group. And largely, they do everything by memory and by hand. It scares me to death. Um, because I know there's a lot of things out there. Now, amazingly, they're, they're pretty quick at retrieving, and, and they've got a pretty good file system. But it makes it a lot easier when you can put all of those things, and it's searchable, uh, so that you can go and find uh, documents and data. Project controls. This, uh, and, and so records management, to a certain extent, falls into all three of those categories. It's elective, sometimes it's uh, conditional, and sometimes it's mandated. Real estate, um, it could fall into any of those. For, for us, it's pretty much uh, the, the category of elective. Then there's project controls, and project controls is, you know, this thing has many, many subcomponents. Most of you are familiar with project controls. You live it every day, you do this every day. 
And there seems to be benefits to having a program, a one-stop shop, to be able to put all of these things in and have them linked together and be able to have uh, all of this information at your fingertips. And so all of you have that program, right? No? Well, I know, but it, it, it can exist. I mean, it can happen, right? So what happens? Uh, a lot of times, at least my experience has been, that you, you get um, boundaries, and some of them are business boundaries. Uh, some of them are boundaries based upon individuals uh, within different elements of a, of a project. Uh, I, I hate to pick, there's, are there any attorneys out here? Before I continue to pick on the attorneys, uh, I don't want to offend anybody. No? Okay, good, we'll have fun then today. Uh, <clears throat> But I think a lot of times we're, we're, we're too sensitive. The other thing that, that happens is uh, for public agencies, what's, what's the other big hammer out there? Public information request. And a lot of these documents are, are open to the public. That's one of the reasons why I just go absolutely berserk on emails. It's amazing what some people will put in emails. And they don't realize that, you know, this, can be, this email could be put out there on the 6 o'clock news. And yet some of the things that we put in there, we have this mentality that it's protected or that it's, well, I, I just sent an email. I mean, good grief, how, how harmful could that be? Uh, design and construction is, is, you know, the 3D modeling. Are, are many of you doing the 3D modeling? That's a bit of older technology. I mean, when you think about technology, it's been around for a while. Uh, in a lot of our applications for the linear construction, it's probably not as beneficial as it is for the vertical construction, some of the complex uh, projects. Um, and, and with things like that, you really have to sit down and you have to look at what's the value added, right? Because there may be something that's, if the juice isn't worth the squeeze, then you're not going to get juice. And, and so in this particular case, if, if it's something that you can implement, it, it does bring a cost with it, but it does bring benefits. And this is one where you've got to make the decision up front very early, because if you get even at 10% level of design or, or 15, 30% uh, level of design, you're, you're not going to want to go back and do this. Uh, it's very, very hard. It's time consuming. So if you're going to do it, you know, you got to do these things up front. Tablets, we talked about that out in the hallway for a little bit. Kevin DeVinis, I think Kevin is here also, and Kevin is one of those great quality guys. Kevin is, uh, is out there in, in Denver with RTD, and, and he He's been using tablet system and, and using that for a long period of time. What's the challenges with a tablet system? Remember those four generations in the workplace? <clears throat> you know, there's uh, some of the, the recent generations that uh, it's amazing what they can do, you know, with those tablets and with those computers. And then when we get to my generation and maybe a generation beyond, I'm sitting here, you know, with one finger going, wow, this is great technology and I can't wait to use more. And then what happens is once I embrace the technology, uh, a couple weeks ago I was traveling to Denver and I, one of the guys was using my tablet in the group to navigate. Uh, you don't have to have a GPS anymore if you have a tablet or a PDA. And I left it in the rental car. My whole work life was gone and I didn't have access to it. And it was, it was the most horrible thing on the face of the earth. And so what did I do? Well, now I started taking notes. I mean, you saw my notes earlier today. <clears throat> Here I am. I'm regressing. And so now I'm back to taking paper notes. And I have notes on stickies, and I have cards, and I have paper that's folded up that'll fit in pockets. And it's really nice when all of that is in one place where you can search it and you can go and find it. But I got to tell you, it was horrible. It was horrible when I lost that device. Uh, so those are some of the things that we, that we have to deal with. Uh, lesson learned there, don't leave your tablet in the rental car. Because you won't get it back, I can test to that. And it's locked, I don't know what they're going to do with it, but you won't get it back. Uh, design and review program, <clears throat> that's uh, one of the collaboration things that we've done. This is a, um, it's one of those opportunities to be able to share. Uh, where you can send multiple people documents, they can collaborate online, and then uh, it, it really sets up for a meaningful discussion. Another one is the video and picture documentation. Uh, if you haven't done this on some of your projects, choose a location and then do a time-lapse photography uh, type um, 
arrangement, and then there's companies that'll string all those pictures together to, to give you a short video. It's amazing. It's amazing. It's a, great, uh, it's a great thing to have. It works really, really well for public presentations, for boards, for regular, uh, regulatory folks, uh, uh, those types of things. But it's just fun to do and it helps you communicate in a way that's, um, that's different. Uh, from a system standpoint, <clears throat> we've also been on a path where we're trying to provide more information to our customers. And when we try and provide information to our customers, you know, the things that you have to consider is it has to be easy, has to be inexpensive, it has to be reliable, it has to be real time, it has to be quick. And if, and if you can't meet those types of objectives, just don't do it. Because it'll be a continuous beating um, until you get it right. Um, I can, excuse me, I can tell you that on the visual message boards, uh, tomorrow, is, there's a little college football game, Texas and Oklahoma play for, in the Cotton Bowl. For us, <clears throat> that's, that's a big deal. We're anticipating to carry about 150,000 people tomorrow to one location, generally all within a two-hour period of time before the game. Some of you may be used to that. That was something that we just were not prepared for. And so when we opened the light rail station out to Fair Park, we were accustomed to getting about 35,000, and so we factored that up to about 55,000. Uh, that first year, we were overwhelmed with about 150,000 people. It was the most, it was the second most horrible day in my career. It was just absolutely terrible. And so we spent a couple of years digging out of that, uh, and, and I think we're better prepared for that. So, um, you know, there, there's the old adage that if you build it, they will come, if it's convenient and it's something that um, has benefits to people, that they, they will definitely use it. And, and again, this is a system in Dallas, Texas, where uh, a lot of folks, and it's probably not a foreign concept in Arizona, a lot of folks think that we still have hitching poach, uh, posts and we, for our horses that we ride to work in, uh, in, in our pickup trucks, and all that is still true. But people will ride mass transportation. And then I talked a little about commuter rail with, with positive train control. This is. Um, this is a congressional mandate, a federal mandate. It is something that came with no funding, and the implementation date is 2015. <clears throat> and all of that is good and well. However, there's interoperability issues. So our commuter trains have to be able to interact, obviously, with freight trains. Because frankly, if we can't, then what's the purpose of having a collision avoidance system? I'm pretty good at keeping our own trains from colliding. It's all those other pesky trains that get out there in my way that I'm concerned about. So <clears throat> the interoperability criteria, uh, as of about three months ago, only half of those criteria were published. And here it is nearing the end of 2013 with an implementation date of 2015. It's likely that uh, there, there may be one or two systems. Uh, Amtrak has a system that they use. Uh, and, and there's a couple others that will be in operation, but majority of them will not be, mostly because of the funding. So those are the types of things that, that, that we talked about, and I talked a little about each of those. I won't, I, th I think these slides are available. Is that right, Anita? So, you know, I, I put a lot of this together just mainly from the standpoint of being able to uh, have as a, as a reference. We talked about records management and file sharing and, and repositories. You know, while the attorneys uh, want the wet signatures and they want the signed documents, they really like the electronic systems because it gives them the ability to go back and search. And so when I pick on the attorneys, the, the, there is some benefit. Uh, unfortunately, with complicated projects, we don't always get to have a project where we don't have the attorneys involved. The biggest thing is collaboration. Uh, here, these are advantages and disadvantages. I've, I've talked through these. The one thing I want to do is just focus a minute on the effect on quality, because <clears throat> I don't want to lose, I don't want to lose sight of what our objective is. Our objective is to leverage technology to provide better quality projects. And when I get to the end, I want to revisit the very definition of quality. And, and so I hope all of this will tie together. One of the things is quality records, you know, they're improved, they're more accessible. Uh, you can put systems in place so that you don't have a, 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 an NCR, a nonconformance issue that now gets covered up and somebody, you know, you just forgot about it. So, so you have those types of things that are good. You have real-time information. 
that you can give your, your inspection staff, uh, your construction staff, uh, you know, pretty much anybody on the project. And the documentation for the end user is at the end of the day, it doesn't, it, it matters what we've built, but then you have all of these things, these manuals, these drawings, these um, guides, and we put all those into a book. And we used to put 12 books out there, and they took these big, huge books, and they're laminated for protection and, you know, against elements, and, you, and everybody gets them, and they put them on their shelves. They stay on the shelves. Nobody uses them. And, you know, and sometimes I saw one of my, and, and I, I love my maintenance teams, but I saw one of the maintenance guys, I said, hey, you know, do you ever get those books off your shelf? And he said, yeah, every single day. I said, really? Tell me more. Because we put a lot of time and effort into those books. He said, well, I'm about to use one of those books right now. And I said, please, demonstrate for me. He gets up, he takes the book, opens it up, takes out one of the laminated pages, puts it on his desk sideways, and puts his lunch on it. Well, that was not uh, exactly the use I was thinking of, but okay, at least you're using it. Maybe uh, between the ketchup stains, you know, you'll find something on there that's of use. I requested that he use a different page every day. Uh, he said, why? And I said, well, because it's a change of scenery and, you know, humor me on that. Uh, but most of all, it contributes to providing customers and stakeholders with a quality product. And, and, and because we can do things better, we can do things quicker, we can be more consistent in our application. With uh, real estate, one of the things that we're using, the GIS mapping, Google Maps, and tie in that to, to our transit-oriented development. And so we have a program on the website where, where developers or interested parties can go. They can look at all of our property that's available for development. They can look at, you know, um, they, they have access to the maps. They have access to the boundaries. They can see the restrictions on the property. And, and so we're using this as a tool uh, to market uh, some of our real estate for sustainability for the agency. The, um, obviously, it's the same thing. It, re it reduces a lot of rework is probably the biggest thing that we're seeing with that. Um, we have reliable, accurate data, and we have a repository where we're not remembering or having to remember. Uh, but it also, at the end of the day, contributes to providing the customers and stakeholders with something of quality that they can use. Project controls, this, there, there are so many applications here in project controls. Uh, I wanted to talk just briefly about uh, some of the, the things here with respect to the effect on quality. Um, in, in my thoughts, schedule money rank right there with quality and safety. And, and so for project controls, you know, safety is job one. We, we've adopted that from Ford. Uh, quality, you have to have quality. And if, you, and if you don't have quality, and people are going to define quality in a lot of different ways. But if you don't have quality, then it's going to be something that is perceived as less. And while people will ride it, they will have a perception that it is less. And so it has to meet the needs of people, it has to meet basic needs, but there also has to be a little something there. Uh, it has a huge effect on safety, safety of the system, whether it's operation, whether it's other things. One of the most powerful things for me is the ability to use these types of tools to deliver projects on time and under budget. We, we have to make decisions every single day about priorities. And without some of these tools and without having them linked together, we're shooting in the dark. We're just you know, grabbing out of the air, and we're hoping for the best. And we can't do that. Our, our resources are much more limited today than they were even 10 or 12 years ago. So we have to leverage technology in order to, to um, bridge some of those gaps. I, I, you know, I told you, Chuck is the bridge builder, right? And so these are the types of bridges that we have to be able to build in order to keep everybody focused and keep them moving down the right path. Some of the other things that you can do is on some of my construction projects, we have what's called the Red Hat Squad. And the Red Hat Squad 
is a group of folks that for that particular week are on the critical path. And so if, if this trade is on the critical path and they have to work in an area, and there's two or three trades that are trying to work in that same area, then what will happen is everybody recognizes the red hats and they go, hey, these guys are in the critical path. They get first access and we'll get them out of there and then the rest of us will fall in. So you can take technology and then you can tie it to something very basic, very simple, and you can communicate that to the team in a meaningful way in order to get a benefit. And that's what I think is probably one of the better uses for technology, is to be able to take it and then put it out there in a way that's meaningful for the rest of the team. There's a lot of different ways to do that. Designing construction, we talked about 3D modeling. This is a really, really good program. Um, subsurface utility exploration or engineering. How many of you use that on a regular basis? Quite a few? Yeah? So have you ever been asked to quantify, well, how many conflicts, how much have you saved by using it? Well, I don't know. I mean, that's the chicken and the egg thing. If I didn't use it, I don't know what I would have been exposed to. I don't know what the cost would have been. I don't know where we would have ended up. But it's one of those things that if you do it and things go well, it's relatively low cost. Um, you know, we can all go back later and sit down and look at projects and say, well, if we would have done it in this case, we wouldn't have ended up here. We did it in this case and we didn't end up there, so I guess by relation, that means that, that it was a worthy thing to do. Um, you know, the rest of these uh, we've talked about, the automated machinery, survey and grade control. Um, the biggest thing there is just having um, parameters or a quality check, checks and balances on these systems. Uh, for instance, you set up your machinery for line and grade and you go and you, you have your surveyors run a loop off of one of your control points and away they go. I had an experience about 10 years ago. There were two control points, one on each side of a bridge. And every single day they went out and they tied them to the closest control point. You know what they didn't do? They didn't check the two control points. So when they got in the middle, about an inch and a half difference because they were using a control point on one side to build from the east, a control point on the other side to build from the west. But they didn't go and they didn't tie in two control points, whether it was the two across or whether it was another control point on the side. So, so when we're talking about systems like this, the idea is, as part of the quality program, you have to get out your crystal ball, you have to rely upon your experience, and you have to say, how am I going to institute some controls? And they, they can't be invasive controls. They have to be pretty straightforward and pretty simple. How am I going to institute that? How am I going to enforce that? How am I going to uh, encourage the use of that so we don't end up in those types of situations? And, you know, uh, again, the, I think, for me, in almost 30 years, I've come to, to a few opinions. I know some of you are shocked that work with me, that I would have any opinions on much at all, but I do. And one of the things I think is, is that a lot of times we're focused on construction and we're focused on quality assurance, we're focused on quality control, and we don't spend as much time up front on the design side. I think if we spend a little more time up front on the design side, we automatically start out with, with a better set of documents that's more clear that contractors can use. I, I'm proud to say that probably at this point in my career, I think the perception of designer good, contractor bad is starting to dissolve away. There's really good contractors. They're very professional. They, they understand with, the, with uh, a lot of the design build projects. They're sensitive to that. They're still not very sensitive to some of the community needs. 
you know, so we have to work on that a little bit. They don't understand that world, especially in the public arena. But, but I think as we focus on design and construction, one of the things we can do, whether it's, and, and I have a planning group, and so the design group always criticizes the planning group. Then when, you know, then when the design folks get it, they pass it to construction, then construction criticizes design, and then construction hands it over for integration, you know, and ops and maintenance criticize construction. And so, you know, no matter where you are in the chain, there's always something that somebody has handed to you that we, we should be sensitive to and look at lessons learned. The more we can improve early on, the better off we're going to be. And sometimes, as you have different teams that are handing over, that's maybe a good application for technology so that we don't, things don't drop through the cracks inadvertently. So, uh, systems, we talked about visual message boards. And part of the challenge here, you know, there's enough technology to be able to get instantaneous messages. You get uh, GPS on the vehicle, and so as the vehicle's approaching the station, you get announcements on the platforms, you get announcements on the trains. We are now approaching the Park Lane station. You know, you will be deboarding on the doors on your right or the doors on the left. We, we have the ability to do that. Where we sometimes get into trouble is what happens when there's an emergency, what happens when there's something that's out of the norm. And we can't program that. We can program standard messages, you know, but that's where I think sometimes there's really no substitute for the brain to be able to communicate to people. And that's a bit of an art to be able to communicate because it's not like we have unlimited, we can't write two or three pages of text to tell them what it is we want them to do. It, 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 things go by so quickly that, that we have to be more focused in our messages. Some of, the, um, uh, some of the benefits, obviously, we're targeting our patrons. We want to provide them information. We want them to be able to understand what's going on in areas of the system that they may be affected by that they can't see. Uh, we talked about, this is a, a fairly simple graphic from a standpoint of technology and what that's going to do in the commuter rail world. It is a lot of fusing of different technologies. Some of these have proprietary systems. Some of these have um, um, technology. I don't know, maybe it's important to say this. Railroad signal technology essentially hasn't changed in the last 80 to 100 years. And so now we're taking that technology, which is great technology, but now we're trying to infuse new technology, and so there's a bit of a gap from a standpoint of bringing those up to speed and then marrying those up to be able to do all of this. We want to be able to have the ability to have speed reinforcement. If an operator should pass out and they're coming up on a critical control point and they don't respond via the controller, then what will happen is the computer will take over and it will stop the train. If you have two trains on the same track, they're communicating to each other, and they say, warning, warning, Will Robinson, the robot, danger, danger. And they both then decide uh, airplanes will divert. Computer will take over and divert. But in the case of technology with the trains, the only thing we can do is stop them on the tracks and keep them from getting together. So those are the types of things that, that this was meant for. And uh, the effect on quality, Obviously, there's a huge safety component. That's the reason why we're doing this. And it is a redundancy to the human brain. Uh, so those are the types of things. Um, I've got about 30 minutes left, and what I wanted to do is just wrap up a, uh, briefly and then see if we couldn't engage in, in some discussion. Um, this is a hard topic, uh, or at least it, it, it is for me. And, you know, I, I hope that I've given you a feel for some of the things to consider as you're looking at implementing technology. Uh, one size does not fit all. There is no way, and, and it may be good for our system, it may not be good for your system, so one size doesn't fit all. It has to be scalable. To do some of these things on Chuck's three and a half billion dollar project are a little different than doing them on a hundred million dollar project. 
And then you have the projects that may be five or ten million dollars. And, and so it has to be scalable and you have to be able to uh, look at this from the standpoint of what is it you're trying to accomplish, what is it that you want to get at the end of the day, how can you communicate it, and how effective can you be. Generally what I will suggest to you is that you use Pareto's rule, the 80-20 rule, and, um, and if you are pretty close to that, you, you probably have a pretty good balance. <clears throat> it doesn't always work. Sometimes you have to up that a little bit or sometimes you have to drop that a little. And then the biggest thing we want to do is just provide our customers and our stakeholders with a quality product. And so at the end of the day, what does that mean? What does that mean? I took some definitions <clears throat> of quality out. And this was pretty interesting when I looked at the, the definitions as they are written. The standard of something as measured against other things of a similar kind. Interesting from a standpoint of quality. It's almost a relative comparison. It's almost a competition. It's almost some of those types of things. Here's where I think you all apply. Not that you don't in the first, but I think you apply here. The degree of excellence of something. The degree of excellence of something. Whatever it is that you do, your task, your job, is to put in place some controls to make your product better, make your project better, to have a continuous improvement or to have an improvement or a measurable improvement. How many of you every single day when you go to work you think that what you do is a degree of excellence? Do you? Okay, there's a few saying yes. How much percentage of the project budget are you given to drive the degree of excellence? It's probably not huge, is it? Is it an excellent proportion? Probably not quite. And so that's why technology is important. It's important because we have to leverage everything that we can in order to drive this degree of excellence. You have a very tough job. You have a very tough job because you are perceived as being in the way of production. And that's not always the case. There are folks that are very progressive, and they understand that the things that you catch and that you do today will only save you time and effort and money tomorrow. There's one last piece that I'll share with you, and then I think we'll have time for questions or interaction. Is that right? A distinctive attribute or characteristic possessed by someone or something. Is that you? As you're trying to achieve this degree of excellence, you notice it doesn't say the best computer wins. It doesn't say the best technology wins. It says a distinctive attribute or a characteristic possessed by someone or something. The message that I want to leave you with today is the things that you do. Sometimes it's hard to understand how it fits in the big picture. We don't have excellent budgets most of the time. Funding's getting harder, it's getting tighter. But it's what you bring to the table. It's how you integrate technology, how you in integrate personalities, how you integrate and use the four or five generations in the workplace that make you 
that give you the ability to provide excellence in one of these projects. So today I just wanted to tell you that much like a lot of these folks, all of these folks that I have had the pleasure of working with in the past, I can tell you that these folks were so important on my projects that we could not have achieved the things that we were able to achieve. To double our system from 42 miles to over to about 87 miles in 10 or 12 years was pretty challenging. We couldn't have done it without quality. We had a high emphasis on safety, and we could not have done that without some infusion of technology. What you do matters. There is not a one-size-fits-all, and it is you, it is you that has the ability to drive excellence in your projects, for your product, for your team. So uh, thank you for your attention. I hope that my message was relevant to you today. It is always a pleasure to be here. It's always an honor. And so uh, I would certainly be willing to um, uh, answer any questions or get some dialogue going if, uh, if that is uh, fit for the purpose. Thank you. We have got time for questions if anybody wants some back there. Questions, comments? Questions, comments. Mr. McKay will be here. Up, oh, up, oh, Chuck has got some questions. Okay. Of course he does. Okay, Chuck. <laughs> Put me on the spot, Chuck. Hello, can everybody hear me? There you okay. Go. Yep. Um, do you think over the past century, that uh, quality has improved or deproved, and I'm going to put that in the uh, in the context of the project that I just came off of, mm -hmm. uh, the Bay Bridge, mm -hmm. snap rods, <coughs> a lot of criticism, delays, and um, it was always put in the context of the Golden Gate Bridge was built in four years, the Bay Bridge was built in four years. We had more. Uh, uh, guts, gumption, integrity, uh, a work ethic, and now uh, with all this technology and all this brain power uh, and, and uh, wealth that we're, we're underperforming our, our predecessors. And, uh, you know, and we have all these uh, brilliant toys. Uh, so what's your, what's your take on that? You know, that in, and this is something that, is, that I deal with on a fairly regular basis. In addition to what you've said, I liken it to um, 100 years ago when the railroads transcontinental was being done. They were, they were producing an incredible amount of footage every single day. And, and some of that technology, some of those railroads, I know in our commuter rail system, we are now replacing track that has a date stamp of 1926. And so we're using, um, we're using those things from the past a lot longer than possibly we would use the others. Chuck, to get to your point, here's what I think. I think, number one, we are in danger of and we are losing the true craftsmen that built a lot of the things in this country. And you guys see it every single day. And so if you look at those four generations, who are the true craftsmen that built our country? Yeah, they're the traditionalists, the, the JFK era, right? And, and these are the folks that came to work every single day with a purpose. And they knew somehow that that purpose fit. And it wasn't diminished because of they didn't get a lot, of, a lot of limelight or spotlight or whatever. So I think one of the challenges that we have as an industry and as a country is 
we are losing and have lost a lot of the true craftsmen. We have, I think, tried to accomplish, bridge that gap to a certain extent with technology. That's why I say to you that the brain is the most powerful computer we have. The multiple generations in the workforce is something that we have to be prepared to deal with. And so I would tell you, I would tell you that from the standpoint of quality as it relates to true craftsmanship, we have done a terrible job as a, an, as a country in keeping up, in my opinion. Now I will tell you this, <clears throat> in the days of old, they didn't have to deal with a lot of the regulations that we have to deal with today. They don't have to deal with a lot of the challenges that we have to deal with today. And a lot of that we, we deal with based upon our successes. These projects are incredibly complicated, not to say that the projects of old weren't. Today, when those, let's talk about one element of a bridge. A hundred years ago, the structural designer, you know what they did then that they don't do today? Each structural designer had their own formula for steel. And if you go back and look at some of these old plans, the structural designer would have his formula for steel. And they would send it to the mill, and the mill would custom make according to that designer. And with the invent of standards, instead of having custom formulas, now they just specify an ASTM, and that's what we've grown into. And that's probably okay. But what else have we done? We have looked to lighter, stronger, better. We have looked to different types of concrete, admixtures, fly ash, chemical components. And all of these things have evolved with technology. But they all carry regulations. So do I think we're as good today as what we were then? I think we are. I think we are. I can tell you that based upon the resources and the tools that we're given, I think we are. I can tell you that then it was a different mindset. And I think people cared more about what they do. Then it was a craft that was handed down from generation to generation. It was to a certain extent an identity for a family. And today we're very progressive in that. Do I think that we're doing as well today? I think we're doing okay. Do I think we are leveraging technology to the extent that we can? I think we're doing okay. Do I think we have room for improvement? Absolutely. I don't think that you're going to be able to do some of these complicated projects and never have an issue. I would suggest to you that in the day, they had issues. Their documentation wasn't such that maybe those types of issues weren't as prevalent as they are today. I will suggest to you that because of technology, because of the news media, the news media is all about telling all the good that's going on in this country, aren't they? That's how they sell papers. They never stretch the truth. I stand sometimes in downtown Dallas, Texas, and we have the Dallas Morning News. At one time we had two or three papers, and there was a balance for objectivity. I read words that are literally etched on their walls. Truth, objectivity, fairness. 
Have you ever been the topic of one of those articles? What do you think? Not so much. I think that sometimes we tend to dwell on those things because there is an I got you type of mentality out there. And while those are serious things, I think that we're doing as well today as we did then. But I also think that it is more about profit. It is more about stamping and cookie cutting than it was sitting down. I can tell you that in the days of old, there were people that were engaged that worked together to advance projects. They couldn't rely on crutches of technology. They didn't rely on some of the things that we rely on today. Do I think we're doing as well today? I think we are. There's a lot of room for improvement. I, I don't know that I answered your question, Chuck. Um, that one's tough for me. You know, I like, I like the positive side. I'm an optimist by nature. And um, that one I, I still get plagued with. I still have board members that will, that will say, you know, geez, Tim, they did 10,000 miles a day 100 years ago. And it take, how long does it take you to put down a light rail, a foot of light rail? Uh, 45 days. <clears throat> Pluses and balances. I don't know. Does that answer your question? Uh, they, yes, it did. Maybe uh, I should turn the tables on you. What do you think? Uh, 26 people died in the building of the Bay Bridge. The first Bay Bridge. None died in the building of the second Bay Bridge. There you go. That, those are some of the regulations, those are some of the things that we've evolved to that you can't put a price on. You know, you can't put, um, you can't quantify. And so I think that's a, a great example of we are doing better in some categories. In some categories, we probably need some improvement. Yeah. Go ahead. You got, you got an active table right behind you there, Chuck. Uh, Tim, I'm not going to put you on the spot like Chuck. That's I've okay. Got, Go ahead. I, no, no, no. Does everybody know Rick Simon? I'm, I'm, I'm going to make a comment on your definition of quality. Yes. I teach a class for the National Transit Institute, and one of the first things I do is ask everybody, what does quality mean for you, to you in one word? So over the last 10 years with about 700 people, we've probably had about 40 different, 40 different definitions. Yeah. I mean, things like reliability, conformance, safety standards, but then you get McDonald's, you get job number one, which is a sort of a hyphenated word, but it does mean something different to every single person. And these are quality professionals, engineers, CEOs, mm -hmm. uh, government employees. I've had two inspector generals. So it's the whole gamut, and it just means something different for everybody. That's a great point. Thank you for sharing that, Rick. What else? There's, there's a couple here. There's some back there. It's hard to see. Put, put your hands up. Here's one right here. And then uh, I think we've got one back here. OK. Thank you. One of the things that we look a lot at, both in auditing and quality management, is the relationships you have with partners. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you have the same approach in what you do at DART in connecting to Fort Worth and going up into Plano? How do you do those handoffs in the community cultures? Yeah, that's a, um, sometimes that can be very challenging, right? I, I think one of the things that you have to do up front uh, is you have to, in, in my opinion, you have to be able to see, I have to have a vision of what it looks like at the end. And then I start working backwards to figure out how I'm going to get there. What I would tell you is, is that we spend a lot of time, a, a typical transit project may, you know, it, the quick ones are maybe seven years. And it's not because it takes seven years to implement them, but it takes a lot of time in the planning side. We spend a lot of time up front making sure that we have as clear as possible objectives. And so in some cases, we'll, we, we meet with these stakeholders, we have a map, and then two or three years later, when we get the funding queued up to do it, a lot of stakeholders have changed. And so you have to go back and you have to refresh those things, right? Uh, what I would tell you is, is that <clears throat> We do a lot of things as a region. There's three transit properties in North Texas. There's Denton County Transportation Authority, DCTA. There's the T, 
Fort Worth Transportation Authority, and then there's DART, Dallas Area Rapid Transit. Commuter rail, we operate commuter rail together. We do that, we have a seamless fare, we just instituted a mobile ticketing app for all, all three properties, and because we do these things together, we save on fixed cost, and just on that one example, we share three and a half million dollars a year that we save. So sometimes we're motivated by money or other things, but that's money that we can reinvest in the system and put out on the streets. In our 13 member cities, as you can imagine, there are contributions from, you know, $200 million a year to $2 million a year. And, and so it's a, it's a tough balance sometimes. Uh, I think that we have a very cohesive group. I would tell you that it comes down to communication, communication, communication. And it's very difficult, as Rick suggested, everybody's definition of quality is a little different. And so when you show up in a community, if I show up over here at this table, say, okay, we're going to give you a quality product. This table is going to have an experience that defines quality for them. This table is going to have one. This table is going to have one. And I think that's where you have to start with a set of basics. And then you have to work on how do you tweak or customize some of this in order to benefit that community. One of the things we do to engage the community is we have an art and design program where we bring in a local artist and then we bring a panel together of stakeholders and we meet to talk about what the station is going to look like at the end of the day. And that gives the station a sense of identity, it gives the community a sense of purpose, and, and we find that our vandalism on the stations is substantially reduced because the community is, feels like they're a part of it and they protect it. So there's a couple of different ways that we use in order to, to try and bridge those gaps and engage those communities. I hope that answered your question. Yes, fantastic. Thank you. Good. Okay, right here. Hello. Um, uh, I am in the construction industry. I manage uh, quality for a light rail um, and commuter rail construction company that actually is working in Dallas right now. Oh. Um, so tell, me, it's great. tell me who it is. Stacy and Whitbeck. Oh, I hate those guys. Right, yeah. <laughs> that, listen, that, that's a great, they are, they are fantastic. That's nice of you to say, thank They're you. They're fantastic. Um, the, the biggest thing that uh, we grapple with on a daily basis is uh, having production see the quality staff as equal to what they're doing as well as what the safety department is doing. And I don't think it just has to do with the perception mm -hmm. um, that the, the craft or the production side has, but what they're expecting the quality staff to do. And in what way would you suggest that I go out to the QC staff on different projects and say, this is what you need to do better in order to convince these people to put you on that equal footing. Do you have any response to that? Absolutely, absolutely. The first thing, that, what's your name? Brandy Lyle. Brandy? Yes. The first thing you can do, Brandy, is go back and tell them, McKay said, <laughs> just kidding. Um, here's what I would suggest to you. Um, number one, on your org chart, it's very, very important who reports to whom. I'm going to focus on quality for just a minute. Quality manager should not report to production. You get that, right? Guess who doesn't always get that? Production, right? So I think the first thing is, is how this is set up. If they are serious about quality, and I can tell you, Stacy and Whitbeck is, then I think what you have to do is you have to get the org chart right first. The second thing is, you have to come up with a benefit. You have to be able to take your program and say, if we will do these things, we can do this quicker. We can cut out some of these things that we spend rework time and money on, right? You have to be able to couch those kind of benefits to them. At the end of the day, these folks are in business to make money. And, and, and they have to understand 
their company reputation is built upon the product that they provide. If it is perceived that it is less, it could be less safe, less quality, whatever, if it is perceived as being less, I would suggest to them that's not the model that they want or the perception that they want with respect to their company in the future. I think that you can sit down with them. You have to champion quality. Can I get an amen? amen. Right? You have to champion quality. Remember we talked about small budgets, we talked about the perceptions of what quality is seen as. You gotta have a champion. If you don't have a servant's heart, if you don't have the eye of the tiger, you're gonna get run over. Now that doesn't mean you should be obnoxious. I get that luxury, but y'all probably shouldn't take after me in that respect. But I, but I do think that you can present your product in a way that's meaningful to them to remind them. Keep in mind, a lot of your superintendents, a lot of your project managers, a lot of those folks, what is their task? Get the job done, right? And so they have this view. Now some of them have a great, great wide angle view. But we have to remind them. So I think the first thing you should do is Tell them why it's a good idea. You should tie it to a vision element for the company, a per, you know, a perception. You should give them the benefits of why your program will be beneficial to them. And you should get the org chart right to where when you have an issue, you're not taking it to the person that will tend to run over you. If you don't get that type of commitment at a high level, polish up your resume. you will be very unhappy. You will feel like your hands are tied. You will, be, you will feel very unproductive. And you, you are better than that. So if they won't meet you halfway and get serious about it, do something else for a living, guys. It is too, life's too short. Find a company that will take you seriously. I believe they will. I work with them. I know the whole management structure from top to bottom. But you have to step out there, sell that product. They'll, they'll go with you. But pack a lunch. Because, you know, you don't go in there and sit down and have a 15-minute discussion, and then all of a sudden, life is good. you got to keep reminding them. Does that help, Brandy? You bet. Okay, you guys.